Early Development of Deep Sea Exploration Deep Sea Exploration really started off with a series of expeditions to measure the depth of the ocean using lead sounding lines in the early 19th century. In 1818, Sir John Ross, the uncle of Sir James Clark Ross, a famous marine explorer, took part in an expedition to locate the Northwest Passage in the Arctic Ocean and pulled up a basket star, a relative of the starfish, from 1.6 kilometer depth whilst carrying out sounding surveys. Years later, his nephew, James, also found a lot of animals living at 1.8 kilometer depth on the Antarctic continental slope. Discoveries like these filled Victorian scientists with excitement and sent them looking for more deep sea animals. However, many scientists at this time believed that the deep sea was an empty, barren place, based on the reasoning that pressure increased with depth. They postulated that at certain points in the sea, the pressure would be too high for any organism to bear. Besides, it was well known that light was refracted by water, whereby the visible spectrum got filtered out, and without energy from the sun's rays warming the deep waters, it could be reasoned that it must be cold down there. In fact, some earlier scientists thought the bottom of the sea must be ice. Therefore, many scientists believe that the darkness, cold, and great pressure would prevent life from flourishing, and some studies seem to confirm this theory. Between 1841 and 1842, scientist Edward Forbes carried out research in the Aegean Sea, dredging the seabed for deep-sea fauna, but he didn't find very much. In 1843, he published his Azoic Hypothesis that beyond 0.6 km depth, there was no life. We now know that Forbes was just a bit unlucky. Though not known at the time, the Aegean Sea was a poor choice for a study site. First of all, it is not very deep and we now know it is not a very productive area away from coastal areas. Oligotrophic waters, meaning with few nutrients, are defined as containing less than 80 grams of carbon per square meter. The central Aegean Sea has about 30 grams of carbon per square meter. With very few plankton at the surface, there is very little food that falls down to support the denizens of the deep. Second, had Forbes actually been in a productive area, he still might not have found much life in the deep because he was using a dredge that was modified from ones used by oystermen. It was inadequately designed to sample the muddy deep seafloor. The mouth of the dredge was narrow while the bag was small, and there were vents only in middle of the sides. The dredge would immediately fill up with mud and thereafter become a wrecking ball let loose upon the seafloor until it was brought up. As it happened, Forbes' theory created a lot of controversy among scientists and luckily fueled more deep sea research. Charles Wyville Thomas, a contemporary of W.B. Carpenter, went on to carry out research in the deep waters off northwest Britain and the Iberian Peninsula aboard the HMS Lightning, 1868, and the HMS Porcupine, 1869 and 1870. They collected sediments from 4.3 km depth and found that the clay ooze they collected was almost entirely made up of the skeletal remains of plankton. The Challenger expedition was carried out shortly afterward.
between 1872 and 1876, and was perhaps one of the most famous in early deep sea exploration because it laid the foundations for what we know today. Prior to the Challenger expedition, very little was known about the shape of the deep sea floor or its fauna. Charles Wyville Thomas was part of this expedition as well, as the chief scientist on board. On its 130,000 kilometer journey, the HMS Challenger carried out a series of sounding surveys, providing the most comprehensive view of the deep sea floor to date and discovered up to 4,700 species new to science. Some of the newly discovered fauna came from trawls taken at over 5 km depth. The last major deep sea frontier was broken between 1950 and 1952 when the Danish research ship, the Galathea, collected sediment and animals from 10.19 km deep in the Philippine Trench. At this depth, the pressure is about 7 tons per square inch, equivalent to two elephants sitting on a person's head. The expedition proved that animals could survive at this depth. The sample they collected contained mussels, shrimps, and even sea anemones.